Uh, so Punchestown turned out to be the Willie Mullins festival, like a dream festival. Um, 400 grand down heading in, 500 grand up at the end. That's sensational. It was, it was like, it nearly could have been over after day one, but it was definitely over after day two. Like the first day, Paul Townend had a, a complete brain freeze, which he's apologised for. It was one of these things, and he, he threw away a grade one race, which Gordon Elliott had a one, two, three in as a consequence. And um, Gordon, I think, went to bed a little bit relieved after day one that he kind of more or less maintained his advantage. He was absolutely obliterated afterwards. And uh, I spoke to, I'm just doing a piece on Racing UK, I think it'll be online today or tomorrow, about um, the duopoly and how, you know, good or bad this is for racing, where two trainers are so dominant. And I spoke to Gavin Cromwell, and Gavin Cromwell said, I kind of ignored Punchestown. He's obviously a trainer as well. He said, I ignored Punchestown because I didn't see any point with the two of them. Willie had 14 horses in a handicap hurdle on Saturday and two reserves. And um, Gordon only, I think Gordon had three winners in the week, so that was quite low. But uh, Willie just, he obviously, he saved a lot of uh, his, his artillery for an assault on Punchestown that paid off. He had more prize money achieved before day four of the five was over, he'd more prize money achieved at the Punchstown Festival than every trainer except Gordon Elliott had accumulated in the entire season. And that entire season had a day and a bit left at that stage. Yeah. so it's phenomenal. It is phenomenal. Uh, why is it not necessarily all good for Irish racing? Is Celtic and Rangers good for Scotland? You know, that, that boring two-horse race that it had been? Celtic and Rangers is good, but if one of them falls off, it turns out uh, just having one team, not so good. Like, you need... You need so I think there was more interest from the casual fan for the first few days in the fact that there was something to get behind beyond the individual horses. So mm. like every sports fan was like, Ooh, there's like massive amounts of money on offer and one guy's a bit ahead. He seems to be very far ahead, the young pretender and he's never beaten him. There's a, like an there's an overarching narrative that you can get your soccer fans into, your GA fans into, are you what do you think's gonna happen here? There's stuff to talk about. Yeah. Whereas like unless you're following a horse you don't really know the names of all the horses? Yeah. If you're I, a casual fan? Yeah, I, I, I think jumps racing has changed as well because, you know, it, jumps racing was very popular because the small man could win, you know, you could fluke your way into a good horse. But now, there's been a lot said about the Irish Grand National having a half million prize money, right? Now, I, I was involved in a horse who ran in the Irish Grand National and he turned up on the day and he was 25 to 1 for argument's sake. If we wanted to run him now, it's five grand to run him in the race because it's 1% of the prize money, right? So five grand to run your horse, so that would put off the small owner. Yeah. The point-to-point -point horses now are being bought for big, big money, and the point-to-point -point circuit, which was more of a kind of a grassroots, the farmer next door type, um, kind of in a f running around a field um, type reality, has now become like a shop window, and it's become very professional because the good winners are sold for like 400, 500 grand, crazy money. So the point-to-point -point circuit has become a little bit out of the reach of of the smaller owner. And, and I'd be more worried about the, the big owners completely dominating and, and th this fairy tale story of Fleming's, Fleming's star and maybe go back to Denoli and horses like that, that, that maybe were owned by the, the man next door. They, that's kind of gone now. So it's like J.P. McManus and O'Leary and Rich Ritchie and all that. And, and I'm not 100% sure Jumps Racing is the better for that in terms of the ethos of it and just that kind of that feeling of it being egalitarian, which is kind of on the way now very much. Yeah, so it used to be, uh, it used to be something that everybody felt that they could be a part of, and now you can really only go as a spectator. Yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's, it's, it's very hard to fluke your way into a very good horse in jumps racing. And, um, you know, Tony Mullen spoke of, in the piece that I'm going to have in Racing UK, he spoke about a few years ago, you could start off training with very little. Now, w Gordon and Willie and everyone else, they've raised the bar so much in terms of facilities in the barns at home with, with uh, walkers, swimming pools, all-weather gallops and all that, that it's very hard to start off now without having a load of money behind you. And it's gotten a lot more professional, um, whether that's a good or a bad thing. And you, you could draw parallels with Gaelic Games here that it's become so professional that it's the, the, the smaller men are left behind. But um, racing has become a duopoly in Ireland, no doubt about it. When that, that statistic about Willie is, I, I could not believe it. In four days, he got more money than every other trainer did in the entire season with the exception of Elliot. Yeah, that is pretty phenomenal, all right. Let's just briefly reflect as well on um, Katie Walsh and Nina Carby retiring. That was the, the big other talking points later on in the week as it became fairly evident that William Mullins was going to win the, um, the Trainers' Championship. Um, how good were Katie Walsh and Nina Carberry? 
They were both amateur riders, so uh, they didn't cut it every day of the week like a professional would, but they... Uh, I, I guess it's kind of a little bit worn as a statement to say, you know, I'd never noticed that it was a girl riding the horse. And that's kind of sexist by, by its very definition to say that, you know, that it's, it's almost implanted in your head that you can spot the girl from the boy on the horse because um, I suppose a lot of the time you can, but certainly with Nina, Nina like Nina was... I mean, her pedigree was impeccable. She, she, her stallion was obviously the late Tommy Carberry um, and her her dam would have been a full brother to uh, Arthur Moore. So she had a great pedigree to make it in racing. And she was a full sister to uh, one of the greatest we'll ever see, Paul Carberry. But Paul would have said, you know, Nina was the most gifted of them all in the Carberry clan, which also had, um, I think, three brothers, if not four, would have been riding, including, obviously, Philip, who won the Champion Hurdle and Sublimity. But Nina was... A, absolutely brilliant rider like I, I can think of very very few mistakes she made and she was just so polished and so much so much style like real style and strength in a finish and the amount of times Nina would be riding the favorite in the bumper and traditionally the bumper would be the last race in in the card and the amount of times punters would put their you know this kind of stupid mentality of I'm losing for the day so I'll get it back in the last which you should never subscribe to but nevertheless many of us do including myself at times <laughs> we'll put on money our money on Nina Nina was the get out of jail clause in the last and uh, she was just uh, such a phenomenal rider and Katie Walsh um right up there with her probably not quite as stylish as Nina, you know, um, but Nina, Nina was set the bar high, but Katie, uh, you know, brilliant rider over a fence, again, very strong in a finish, um, no fear, no fear at all, and has shown herself to be very adept at buying and selling horses as well, um, very good business brain on her, um, and, and a very likeable character as well, you know, and just, just a decent skin, and to, for the two of them to go out without any serious injury is really testament to their quality. People shouldn't underestimate that as well. They didn't have many falls, you know, they really didn't. They, they, they were very, very good at, at uh, getting horses over fences, and it'll be interesting to see if either of them um, ever thinks about going down the training route, because we have some um, very successful female trainers, notably Jessica Harrington, I suppose, but... Uh, they, they, I would hope that there are a lot of female amateurs to come as well who will look on them as the role models. And I know that many did, like uh, Lisa O'Neill and Rachel Blackmore, who are there at the moment. And then one of the things we wanted to talk about was um, Sam Crow falling. One of the big stories of the week, whether or not Sam Crow was going to go in the champion hurdle, ended up um, heading off odds on favourite at the end. And disappointing. I don't know what I can say about this because he fell in a hurdle race running against the seniors and... You'll always say, like, if you run a novice against the seniors, there's a chance that because they're doing things a little bit quicker and there's more pressure on their jumping, that things can go wrong. But the Sancro fall, every time I watch it, there's no real mistake there. He just crumpled on landing. So I, I don't know what we can glean from this. They went into the race hoping that he would tell them by winning or, or not winning where he was going to go next season, I think. That was one of the reasons, and the other reason was he would help Gordon over the line in the trainer's title. By the time the race happened, the, t the title was gone anyway, and then Sam Crow ends up falling. We don't know if he would have won, we don't know what trip he wants next season. So it was, a, it was a bit disappointing, but at least he didn't suffer injury or die. And so, a hurdler next season? Don't know. Um, I, I, they're going to think about it over the summer. I, I, I think he'll go chasing, to be honest. Uh, the Jig and Sound, who are... I referenced buying these point-to-pointers. They bought him out of a point-to-point -point, um, with a view to going chasing, you know, and they buy all their horses with a view to going chasing, and I can't see why they should change their mind with Sam Crow just because he won a hurdle race at Cheltenham. He didn't win this hurdle race, and he's a, he's a chase. He's a beautiful big horse built for fences, and uh, I think they, could, they should go down that route. I think the question should be whether he's going to be a Gold Cup horse or a champion chaser. Okay. Uh, and one other thing is that, uh, is it tomorrow the new season starts, or today? Today. Um... Today, yeah, it brought up a famous comment where I once slagged a jockey and then he was, he, he, I didn't slag him, I said he gave a horse, didn't give him a great ride, but um, it's the first day of the season, he can set the record straight and he won the first race in Ballon Robe and he was champion, he was the leading jockey um, for, for the season because it was the first race and he had a, had a real dig at me um, subsequently and at the races, which many people know what I'm talking about, but um, 
somebody whoever wins the first race. Did you deserve it? Um, I didn't deserve the slur he gave. In fact, I didn't deserve it at all, actually. Um, but uh, anyway, Eddie Power knows what I'm talking about. But <laughs> it starts again in Kilbegan this evening, yeah, and yeah. Um, the pursuit of winners goes on. Yeah, and so um, at Kilbegan, is that the chance for the small guys to shine? Yeah, and there, there is a lot of that. I have to say with HRI as well, Horses in Ireland, uh, you know, they've been conscious of these problems and they brought in a lot of these races that are restricted to certain horses that by definition are going to suit the smaller trainers and owners. So they, 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 they haven't lost sight of it. And the, the thing for HRI is, do you disrupt the, the natural flow of the market and the free market in the way, or, 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 you know, do you cater for the struggling small trainer? I think you need to, but at the same time, you have to look at these two trainers that are just really, really good and don't punish them for being very yeah. good. Try to learn from them. And in the words of Boxer and Animal Farm, I will work harder. And I think they have to work harder.